It landed on the ground and hopped right back to its feet, snarling and looking more angry than hurt. It was short but bulky, covered in black fur, with sickly yellow eyes and long claws. He got up and swung his rifle around from his back, but before he could aim, the beast slammed it from his hands. He ducked and kicked and stabbed with his utility knife, but soon found himself thrown to the ground, his head bashed against a rock. Dizzy and weak, he raised his head. The creature approached him again, rows of teeth bared, ready to turn him into its first snack in this world. Something shot past it from the left, leaving a trail in the air. The sound of dashing steps came to his ears, just before another shot missed the creature by just a couple of inches on its other side. A shadow fell over him, and he looked up to see someone sailing through the air, the thin ropes to either side of the creature wrapped around its neck, and as the rogue skipper reached to the ground behind it, she gave it a hard tug, sending its head flying off its shoulders as she landed in a graceful crouch. He managed to pick himself up into a sitting position, warily eyeing the rogue skipper as she recalled her ropes and the hooks, snatched back into place in her bracers, while the beyonder's head bounced across the ground. She gave him a little smile. Up close, she looked younger than he had expected. She looked toward the site where the huge beyonder had landed, then cast a smirk at him as she offered him a hand. Looks like you've got bigger things to chase after than me. Hang on my bondage, if you make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to a night, and if they can stop you, then you become something else entirely. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. A hotly debated topic I recall in the mid-2000s among some circles was the rising appearance of so-called Western anime. Shows and works that were not necessarily from Japan, but were clearly inspired by Japanese works in one form or another. The question was, should these works count as anime even if they're not from Japan? Naturally, this sort of inspiration would spill into games, causing the debate to take on a new form of an old branch, that being right versus wrong inspiration. This would transform the term weeaboo into a form of condemning anything remotely non-Western in a given work. Personally, I found the whole debate rather stupid in both its forms, with its nadir being the debates around the infamous Book of Nine Swords for D&D 3rd Edition. It seemed as if to some, you're not allowed to take ideas from this new medium because... Shut up. In a way, it reminded me of the claim that World of Darkness introduced a bunch of goths into the hobby. Whatever your opinions on manga are, I find it counterproductive at best and elitist at worst to treat it as this separate thing divorced from design and inspiration elsewhere, and only certain people can take notes from. Purity tests are just another name for a dick measuring contest, and we've got more than enough of those. Now why do I bring up this nonsense about anime and fandom? Because today's topic is an example of being manga inspired. A game that outright credits Avatar and Final Fantasy as its chief inspirations. A game called Anima Prime. Before I continue, I should note that there's a free PDF version of the game available, link in the low bar. The free version has a more traditional, straightforward approach without any of the flair. It's basically all text. The full version has a similar page layout to Star Wars Saga Edition, but the larger font makes this a significantly better read in my opinion. Occasionally it reads like it's in the first person rather than the third, but that's understandable as this is largely a one-man project. Like a lot of indie titles, it's a strong start that ends on a slightly weak note, and I think it'd stand to have an appendix summarizing the different effects. However, for what's there, it's a decent layout. Character creation is more about ideas than strict crunch, but it doesn't go quite full story game. Now, since I style myself as a gaming monk, it'd be appropriate to do a monk-type character for this. With its own twists, of course. The first couple steps, your concept and your mark of power, are mostly fluff. Concept is a broad idea of the type of character being played, and something that should be familiar if, if you've played a World of Darkness game at least once. Mark of Power, on the other hand, is a distinctive feature in their appearance that's going to vary from person to person that would identify them as different. Now for our case here, the concept is that of a warrior monk, while Mark of Power being having his order's tenets tattooed along his back. The third part of your origin, your passion, is a different matter entirely. Passions can be described as the driving emotional state of the character. Mechanically, this can grant extra charge dice if the right conditions are met. Of course, our starting passion isn't necessarily the one we're stuck with. It may change once per session or as appropriate. In our case, the most appropriate passion listed would be Glory, which grants us two charge die when inflicting a finishing wound on an opponent. We'll get into what the hell charge die are later. The first real crunchy step is choosing your character traits. 
These work kind of like distinctions in Marvel Heroic. They're trademark factors of your character that are unmistakably your own, but unlike the mark of power, these can be utilized in actions as playing up your character. Whenever one applies, you may mark it. These marks can be expended to re-roll dice. It's implied that these traits are not static. They can be changed during play as appropriate. We have three traits we can fill in now or later. For our example, we'll go with Trained by the Order, Justice is Blind, and the Swordless Blade. Next are your skills. You can have a primary, secondary, and tertiary skill, similar to Wushu Open. These skills are ranked at 4, 3, and 2 respectively. And while the book does list off skills related to the included Ghost Field setting, you're encouraged to make up your own if the situation calls for it. For this, we'll be using our own set of skills. Martial Arts at 6, Exorcism at 4, and Acrobatics at 2. With the basic parts out of the way, it's time to deal with the core stats. Each character starts with an action pool maximum of 10, a charge pool maximum of 6, 3 wounds, and 2 defense. Finally, for the linchpin of your character, you have to choose powers. The character starts with 9 powers, which fall into 4 categories. Passive, which are continuous effects. Charge, special effects that consume charge dice. Soulbound weapons, artifacts with their own advantages and effects. And Eidolons, creatures that your character can summon. While the list of power options can be overwhelming, especially if you want some optimization, there is fortunately a set of package ideas in a primary and secondary sense that can provide a decent framework. We'll be using two of these packages, Savant and Warrior Monk. This grants us the following powers. Charge Boost, Maneuver Boost, Resilience 2, Body Resistance, Force Attack, Refresh, Rise of the Phoenix, and Whirlwind Attack. The final bit of fluff is your character's background and links. These are meant to act as your character's backstory or bits thereof. The difference between background and links is that the latter is giving express permission to the GM to utilize in the campaign as appropriate. For background and links, respectively, we'll go with Mission from the Order and Best Friend is an Oathbreaker. None of these are meant to be set in stone, they're merely the starting points for later adventures. As I said before, character creation is more fluff than crunch. As such, your enjoyment of the game is going to be dependent on how well you can visualize just enough ideas about your character. The two sticking points I can see being an issue for some are the semi-limited approach to skills and the power system. In the case of the former, it might be a hurdle for those who are used to games with a wide skill pool, especially if it's going to be on the GM to create a decent variety of skills for the players to feasibly use without too much overlap. In regard to powers, it's mostly an issue of optimizing it properly for this game's style of play. The game advises certain essential powers like resilience and at least one charge ability, which is veering a little too close to the you-need-to-have-this-for-a-good-build territory for my taste. Ultimately, it's a net positive. But like a lot of freeform games, the GM is going to have to be a bit more hands-on regarding character creation. Die rolling is separated into two factors, maneuvers and actions. The former being the die roll to determine what you'll be able to do during your round. In a sense, think of maneuvers as the setup and actions as the execution. When setting up your maneuver, you describe the action first and add 1 to 3 dice from your starting action pool of 10 and 2 to 4 die from a relevant skill marking the skill is used. Once you've got the pool ready, you'd roll that many d6. Any die that roll 3 through 5 are added to your strike pool, and any 6s are added to your charge pool, which is spent on charge powers like force attack. Powers notwithstanding, you can only generate 5 results, which means you have to prioritize strike or charge. An additional wrinkle is that if you roleplayed a trait in a previous scene and marked it, you may unmark that trait to reroll any 1s or 2s you rolled for the maneuver. Once the pulls for strike and charge are generated, you can use them in an action. Actions can take two primary forms. Strikes, your attacks, and achievements, which are indirect goals that can grant you an advantage. In both cases, it would take up to six dice from your generated strike pool, and any dice from a relevant skill. Rolling that many and keeping threes and... Like with maneuvers, you may use a trait to re-roll misses. The sole difference between strikes and achievements is how their results are used. In either case, you must overcome a difficulty. With strikes, this is the defense of the target, in which succeeding inflicts one wound per multiple of successes that you rolled. For achievements, you merely need to beat the target difficulty to gain its effect for the rest of the scene. A final monkey wrench in the system is the game's extra effort mechanic, known as awesome tokens. These are generated whenever you earn at least five dice and maneuver roll, and can be used for rule bending effects such as taking extra actions or having a single action target multiple opponents. The interesting thing about the core mechanic is that it's so rooted in resource management for its use of tactics 
rather than placement like in other games. The key is managing your three pools to determine the best time to use effects. That said, the interplay between the three pools can be overwhelming at first, and it could have used a flowchart to help ease that problem. Also, I find the defense multiples effect a bit clunky at first, but it's an alright way to show that winning is more often a thousand cuts rather than assembled bombs. Now both soulbound weapons and eidolons count under powers technically, as I mentioned before, but since they have their own quirks, I feel I should address them here. We'll start with soulbound weapons. Despite the name, calling them weapons is a bit of a misnomer as they don't have to be in the form of weapons. They can be talismans, armor, devices, and so on. The physical form is merely descriptive fluff. In any case, a soulbound weapon is granted by the same named power, which adds one effect slot to the weapon. Additional slots can be granted by using the weapon upgrade power, which can be taken up to three times for a maximum of four effect slots. Soulbound weapons can have extremely powerful effects that aren't available with normal charge powers, but the major disadvantage that they have is that they can be disarmed. A GM can spend an awesome token to temporarily cause someone to lose powers from a soulbound weapon, but as a trade-off, they gain two dice per effect slot to immediately roll for strike and or charge. During combat, you may attempt to regain a lost soulbound weapon by making an achievement action with a difficulty of 8. Eidolons, on the other hand, a term likely familiar to anyone who's played Final Fantasy, are summoned creatures that can act as a second PC for the character. Similar to soulbound weapons, they have their own set of powers and advantages. However, an Eidolon must first be summoned, obviously, by spending charge dice equal to its level plus one. Eidolons and player characters cannot act on the same turn, but they can share action, charge, and strike dice with each other. In any case, being able to summon requires both the summoning and open bond power. While the book does have a few sample Eidolons, it also provides a set of rules for creating your own. These are similar to character creation rules, but with their own quirks. First, you need to determine its level, ranging from 0 to 5, and whether it's an individual, a squad, or a swarm. Second are its basic stats, much like a character's. In this case, they have one wound, a defense of 2, an action pool limit of 2, and a charge pool limit of 4. Furthermore, Eidolons only gain one skill rated at 4, and thus cannot mark. Following that, an Eidolon gains four Eidolon exclusive powers, plus three more for every level they have above zero. Finally, they have to choose a weakness from the list of provided weaknesses. I like both systems for this, but it can highlight one particular problem. Because of the freeform nature of the game, there isn't a set experience system. As a result, it would be very easy for either weapons or Eidolons to take a significant amount of space on the sheet at the expense of other powers. That is, of course, assuming that you're only supposed to have the nine powers at any given time that you start with, but this can get in the way of optimization that I mentioned before. That said, I still feel it's a net positive, but much like character creation, it's going to require a closer hand by the GM to supervise things. Despite having Final Fantasy and Steampunk as its chief inspirations, I feel that Anima Prime is an extremely versatile game. I could easily see it being used in a variety of other genres beyond the aforementioned Gestalt. While it is narratively focused, it manages to do so in a way that keeps itself from being full story game. That said, there's no denying that this is a very combat-centric game, and it makes no apologies for being that. The beginning and end of the roleplay mechanics are primarily the traits, and those are in service to the combat later on in combat scenes. If you are someone who prefers a stronger focus on character roleplay, this may not be exactly for you. All that said, I can give the game a stamp of recommended. The freeform nature and use of its source material makes a great lead-in for people just getting into the hobby, and it's a game that can exist in a happy medium between narrativist and game styles of mechanics. However, this might be a harder sell for those who have already been trained to approach RPGs from a crunchier perspective, as it doesn't follow a lot of the muscle memories that are in more mainstream RPGs. Still, if you're a fan of console-style RPGs and want to insert a little of that into your gaming table, this is a steal at just 10 bucks. Hey there folks, thanks for watching through it. If you liked what you saw, make sure to leave a like and shoot me a few lines about what you'd like to see next. I'm always looking for feedback. I do have an imager album that's going to contain future review ideas. That's expanding every moment. And if you feel like supporting your favorite monk, check out my Patreon. That's going to be linked in the low bar. But until then, my name is Miltra. I'm your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.